right, so we are on. So our guest today is economist Jennifer Doliak from Texas A&M University, where she's also the director of the Justice Tech, Tech Lab. Jennifer studies crime, discrimination, and various other aspects of the cr uh, criminal justice system. Jennifer, welcome to Policy and McCombs. Hi, thanks for having me. So when we scheduled this visit, was actually I was checking on my calendar. It was over a year ago when we scheduled scheduled your visit, and and you know at the time I was very excited to hear about your work and, and your research. But since then things changed quite a bit, and and we are we're here maybe at a even more even more excited about having you join us today because your your expertise, given uh, um, a lot of the rhetoric out there these days, is, is something that that uh, I'm really glad to, to hear from you. So let's start with some big picture questions, um, and. You know, I don't know how to ask this question in, a, in an easy way, but um, how would you assess the general state of policing in the U.S.? So in particular, I'm thinking about in regards to a lot of the cur current focus on proposals that the protesters have brought to bear since, since May in particular. Like, you know, are we over police? Are we under police? Do we spend too much on police? Uh, um, is our police too violent? I don't know. What's your general take on it? Yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, one that we have a good amount of research evidence on, uh, but could always use more. And there are certainly topics within this that um, are understudied, I think, and where researchers are focusing their attention. So I think big picture, um, uh, we know that there are too many incidents that unnecessarily escalate between police and, and local residents that unnecessarily escalate to either violence or even an arrest. Um, too many people are arrested for kind of low-level offenses where it doesn't do any good uh, to public safety to to take those people and and you know book them in jail. Um, and then of course the the incidents that have been getting a lot of media attention are those where uh, someone is shot or killed apparently for doing nothing wrong, right? Where we have these videos that wind up going viral where it seems very clear that the person was no threat to the police officer in the moment. Um, and so clearly there are problems. <laughs> and I think, you know, this is a somewhat challenging policy space to, uh, to discuss because this, the extent of those problems is, is more difficult to, to measure. Um, the reality is that we just don't have good data on what police do <laughs> and uh, how much violence there is. Um, you know, there isn't data on police use of force that's collected in any systematic way. Uh, so, I mean, my general sense is we know that, uh, you know, racial discrimination in particular is a problem in basically every walk of American life. And so it shouldn't be surprising that it's an issue in policing as well. Um, and so racial disparities in police use of force and, and arrests are, are surely a problem. And there is some research evidence showing that that is true. Um, so, so that's one piece of it. Uh, the other piece that you asked about is kind of like what you know, to police, are we under policed or over policed? And that question is also sort of complicated to answer. <laughs> um, most of the research on this is really focused on what's the impact of police on crime. And there it's just overwhelming the evidence uh, showing that hiring more police officers, putting more police on the streets, increasing police presence in general does reduce crime rates. So if what we're focused on is reducing crime, then uh, then the best evidence suggests that our U.S. cities are dramatically under-policed and we should be hiring more police officers. Um, but of course, that's, you let know... Me question, let me ask you just a quick question on that. So, so uh, the evidence of being under-policed is that a question on, is a measure on the number of cops, a number of, number of uh, actually people in the police force. Uh, does that, how about the money that we spend? Is that, is that any indication that we spend an overwhelming amount that don't have the enough resources or, or actually we don't relative to maybe other places that you know, teach us about the value of, of having more police? Do we spend enough? So uh, most of the studies on this uh, are focused on often you know, money spent on police hiring in particular. Uh, you, the, the biggest piece of police budgets is salaries and pensions and the you know and even training which all like is you know part of hiring more cops um and so uh so i'm not sure that we have many studies on kind of like other pieces of police spending and and to what extent they're cost effective but the biggest the biggest expense to police i was just thinking about the sort of like the u.s police generally when you look at a police car or a police mm -hmm. person in the u.s they're just like overly equipped right they have like a bunch of stuff and gear and Whereas like a few that elsewhere in the world is not that. So I, I would guess that we, we spend a lot more money on equipment as well. 
as uh, than other places, perhaps. Yep, we do, and that that is something that you know a lot of police departments get federal grants um, for those for that type of equipment, um, uh, or they get it for free through um, the 1033 program, I believe it is, uh, which basically is like. Um, used to be military equipment, but now is, is kind of passed on to the to police departments and law enforcement when it's no longer needed by the military. So it, I, uh, I'm sure police departments are also spending a good amount of money on that stuff, but they actually get a surprising amount of it, not from local dollars, um, it's coming from somewhere else. Um, so um, yeah, so there's kind of this question about, you know, what are the benefits of all of that spending? And there we're able to quantify what the benefits are in terms of crime reduction, at least the hiring piece. Uh, but there are costs too, and that, you know, as economists, like that's something we think about, <laughs> but we don't have really good measures most of the time of what the costs of policing are. Uh, there's certainly lots of, lots of um, qualitative evidence and uh, ethnographic evidence suggesting that there are real costs to, uh, you know, what people think of as over-policing um, and, and negative relationships between police and communities. Um, but that's something we're just beginning to be able to quantify. Um, and we have to quantify it if we want to be able to weigh the costs against the benefits, right? We have to have, we have to be able to put numbers on it. Um, and so there's some evidence that's beginning to come out. Um, there's an economist at UCLA, Emily Weisburst, who's actually a UT PhD, uh, who has a nice paper looking at the impacts of putting more police in schools. And she finds that um, when uh, more uh, school resource officers are hired, these, these police officer stations in schools, um, graduation rates fall, particularly for black students. Um, there's another paper uh, by an economist named Desmond Eng who uh, looks at the impact again on, I believe also looking at uh, like school completion, but of having a, a local school shooting or a local shooting of a, of a student or, or young person on students who live in that area and finding big negative effects. Um, and this is so those, those will go in different directions, right? In those are going to go, well, yeah. so yeah, so basically like it seems like there are big costs to policing, so that's what these papers are trying to quantify, and that's going to go in the other, you know, so there are costs, and but we also know there are benefits to having police officers there, um, and so figuring out, you know, what's the optimal number of police officers is something we're just at the beginning of, I think, um, in terms of, you know, figuring out those costs to weigh against the benefits. But uh, this is all to say it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's good for, for, for our jobs. That's um, right. Lots of work right. <laughs> so, so now turning to some more specific proposals that you hear. So one of the, the sort of major cries in the country has been, at least from a very vocal uh, uh, a set of, set of uh, I don't know what I call it, just protesters, but there's, a, there's definitely a vocal ask, uh, group uh, demanding that police be defunded. And, and defunded police becomes this sort of major uh, cry for reform. I think there's also all sorts of different questions, uh, 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 demands for reforming police, but I think that one is the one that gets the most attention. And, and I think that you spoke about already about the fact that we don't know necessarily what's the optimal level. We know the more is better to reduce crime. That is clear from the data. We don't know whether there, there are some externalities or costs created by, by, by that increase. Um, but when you look at the proposals on the table right now, in terms of, I think BLM in particular is a group that has put forward some very, you know, uh, aggressive proposals on 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 uh, uh, reforming police and defunding police. Do you see some good ideas in there? Do you see, or or at this point, do you think that we just don't have enough evidence to really be uh, careful about about weighing the pros and cons? I think both. I think there are some great ideas going around, and we don't know which ones are going to work yet. <laughs> and so, what in many ways, it's, like, it's a really <laughs> exciting time to be a researcher who, who thinks about these issues, right? Because it's there's going to be a lot. Hopefully, there'll be a lot of new stuff that's tried um, that we'll then be able to see, you know, what works. Uh, and the the upside of our very decentralized criminal justice system is we have. Uh, you know, at least depending on how you count 12,000 um, police departments across the country. And so if they all do something different, then those are, those are some great experiments that we can evaluate. Um, you know, so I think the, the defund the police movement is, um, you know, on its face is sort of a call for cutting police budgets. Um, the actual proposals tend to be a bit more complex um, and really are pushing for uh, reimagining what police are doing and and not making police you know the only people we can call whenever we have a problem so a lot of the the uh, the, the calls that police departments get are for um, situations that are 
you know, surely better handled by people who are social workers or medical professionals. You know, they get a lot of mental health calls and stuff like that. And you ask any police officer and they're like, yeah, we don't want to go on those calls either. Like, you don't want us there. We don't want to be there. We're not trained for this. Um, and so I think there's a broad consensus that, that uh, you know, rethinking how, you know, what types of resources we make available for those kinds of situations is, is a good thing. Um, but frankly, it hasn't been tried in many places yet. So we're gonna need, there's gonna need to be some experimentation and iteration to figure out what works best. Um, I mean, the other piece of this that, that sort of makes me a little bit nervous as I watch these calls across the country is often it's going to wind up, you know, they're, they're sort of the, the true underlying policy proposal that, that these groups are pushing for. And then there is what the politicians hear in the moment and what they actually do to kind of get their constituents to stop yelling at them. <laughs> and, and that could wind up just being cutting budgets and then walking away. Right, and if we do that, then I think you know the research evidence is shown quite clearly that like what we're going to see is crime rates go up if basically police departments just cut their hiring and we don't do anything instead. If we don't move that money somewhere else, um, and if we don't have a, a very clear plan, like you know the budget cuts can be very quick. But building up these alternate systems is going to take a while, and it's not it's not going to be an overnight fix. And so uh, even if we you know cut the budgets and say our right, well next year we'll put that money in the, the social services budget instead or whatever, um, you could wind up seeing a big increase in crime rates in between. So making sure we have like a transition plan is going to be really important. And um, uh, I hope people on the ground are thinking about, but it's not always clear from the public conversations. That that's the case. So in thinking about that plan, uh, you mentioned this sort of like opportunity that we have to, to, to you know, run all the experiments and, and you, you, you have studied a lot of these experiments that actually have been put in place before. Uh, there's a number of like RCTs, like randomized control trials that have been done on things like body cam usage or, or um, I guess that's the one that comes to mind, but there's been others, right? And, and you've written a lot about, about those. Uh, can you, for, I guess two questions. One is that, do you see more of an appetite in different localities to actually engage in these RCTs? And two, uh, what are the ones that we have maybe learned something about already? I think you, there's a few things that are sort of like potentially encouraging on, on, on some ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think in general, there's a, a, a lot of openness in the criminal justice space broadly, but especially within police departments and, and engaging with researchers and running these kinds of experiments. Uh, it certainly varies from place to place. Some are more open to it than others, but um, you know, there, there's some really great criminologists who for quite a while now have been running experiments with police departments, particularly around things like hotspot policing, like figuring out if it matters, if we put this police officer on this street corner rather than that street corner, like to what extent that police presence matters. Um, and so those were some of the, the earlier versions of these randomized controlled trials um, that really started changing the culture of, of police departments and their willingness to experiment. And so again, there are plenty of police departments that are you know, not interested and not on board yet, but it is quite encouraging how many, especially big city police departments have research departments, have, um, have data people who are there and ready to engage with academics. Uh, and so I always tell students, like, if you have a great idea for something you think police, a local police department should be doing differently, like, start, like, start that conversation, because it's very possible that they'd be willing to, to try that. Um, yeah, so what do we know so far? So uh, there is, so body-worn cameras, you know, is something that comes up every time we have one of these viral videos showing a police shooting, uh, and there's a call for a police accountability. There was this real sense, you know, the, the last time we had this big national conversation, there was a real appetite for change. Um, there was a real push to have uh, police departments around the country adopt body-worn cameras and basically have every cop wear a camera all the time, have it turned on anytime they're interacting with a local resident um, so that, you know, we can go back and see how they, how they acted and if they did something wrong. Um, and so unlike a lot of different technologies in particular, but, but police practices more, more generally, we actually have a lot of evidence on the impacts of body-worn cameras. There have been a lot of randomized controlled trials where randomly assigned some cops to wear a camera and others not. Uh, turns out the punchline is on that, they do nothing. <laughs> they do nothing to police behavior. Like if your goal with having cops wear body-worn cameras was that they would kind of know that people are watching and so be deterred, from doing something bad that they know is wrong, 
then uh, we should see that in the data. We should see a change in their behavior. And we don't see that. You know, there's some variation across different departments. Some places, you know, behavior gets better. Some places behavior actually gets worse. Uh, but on average, it's just null effect. Um, and one of the bigger uh, experiments was done in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. A uh, huge randomized controlled trial. It was like quite a feat that they, that they did it and pulled it off. And it was just, you know, null effects across the board on everything. Um, and you know we, we can we could talk about you know, the possible reasons for this, um, but the the punchline is that if your goal is to change police behavior, body worn cameras are not a good investment, uh, and they're expensive. So it's good to know uh, if you know if that's your if that's your goal, you should be spending that money on something else. Huge cost, no clear benefit, right? And, and, and he, now now that 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 question was whether there was any kind of change in behavior, um, mm -hmm. no no net change in behavior, but any change on accountability. So for example, it might be the case that we don't change behavior, but whenever we see a bad thing happening, perhaps yeah. that's evidence that can be better used for either retraining or punishment, or is this that an indication of that? Um, right, so um, you know, the, those types of events are relatively rare. Um, and so it's really difficult to pick up you know, something, uh, the use of that kind of evidence or whether the person was actually um, you know, fired or charged with a crime or something like that uh, in the moment. There just aren't going to be enough of those situations. Um, but I think the way I think about this is that if cops on the ground have the sense that there are going to be those kinds of consequences, then we should see a change in behavior. Um, if, if it's a conscious, you know, choice to be right, right. using force in the moment when they shouldn't be. Now that, you know, it's totally possible here that uh, the cops who are using unnecessary force or behaving badly in general don't necessarily know it's wrong. They might like legitimately be afraid in the moment. And that's something that maybe we should be training them differently or maybe those people just shouldn't be cops, right? Like I probably would not be a very good cop. I would not be like running toward danger. <laughs> you know, not everyone is well suited to this very difficult and dangerous job. And if you're the kind of person who like gets easily freaked out and pulls a gun on anyone, you probably shouldn't be a police officer. So one thing that these that cameras could do is potentially help us identify who those cops are. Um, you know, the on the other hand, it turns out like there's some research that is out there that like tries to you know use fancy machine learning techniques on you know existing data to figure out who the cops are. There's any problems down the road? It turns out it's not hard. <laughs> it turns out that like if you get a lot of once you're on the job, you know you get complaints, past complaints. From, low, from citizens predict future bad behavior, future like real problems. And so the problem here is, uh, seems to be more about um, uh, you know, what to do with those officers once we've identified that they're going to be problems down the road. The problem is not identifying them. So the cameras really aren't necessary for that either. So okay, body cams then is something that yeah. I think pretty much <laughs> every well-funded police department in the country has adopted. Uh, some yeah. level of body cam uh, uh, um, uh, where uh, usage and and again we are seeing no no particular no particular effect there any undoing of that after after the the after the you know the findings of these RCTs so we learned that the policy might not be very effective and it costs us a lot of money mm -hmm. any trend of moving away from it or or, <laughs> <laughs> or that what? learning has been sort yeah. of like, you know, I think. Um... Yeah, not that I've noticed. I think most police departments are still, and a lot of citizens are still calling for, for cameras. And I think, you know, one way to think about this is that, um, you know, what people are hoping for from cameras is not actually behavior change. What they're hoping for is having the footage on file in case something goes wrong and they have, then they can prove it, right? That they can prove that something. And so it's sort of like, again, sort of preparing us for the situation you described where that footage can be used to get that cop off the force or to, to charge them with a crime or something. Uh, now, you know, we hear plenty of stories in the news that suggest that it's not done very often currently, but you can imagine, I think a lot, there's a lot of appetite for moving in the direction where there is more accountability for, for bad behavior. So I think there's a sense of like, you know, cameras provide transparency and even if they don't change behavior on the job or in the moment, um, they might still be worth it because we could still have the footage and sort of the proof that someone shouldn't be a cop anymore. 
Um, and, uh, and that's a totally reasonable thing to want to pay for. We just need to be honest with ourselves about what we're paying for uh, and not, not kind of hoping uh, for stuff that we're not going to get. And it also points out to something that is, is uh, difficult for us in our research, right? Which is sometimes we, we try to focus on short-term outcomes because that's what we have. You know, if I think about what is the effect on current use of force by having the body cameras or not, right now we run RCT, we check, we don't see anything, but perhaps this, you know, 10 years down the road, the sort of continual wear usage of those cameras might lead to um, more indictment of people that need to be indicted, even more evidence in court for even the criminals, not only against the cops for that do bad behavior, but the availability of that evidence might be useful for having the correct you know, outcomes in the criminal justice system later on, right? And that's very difficult to measure and wait for and so on. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, what you're describing is sort of like culture change, right? They could start ushering in sort of culture change. It's very difficult to quantify in the moment. I guess I think of it, uh, this situation as being a little bit less about, um, Kind of short run versus long run and more about like measurable versus much more difficult to measure like well, i was thinking i was thinking about something measurable in the long run as well which is which is you know that's now you have perhaps better evidence for certain things so whenever you're trying to adjudicate an issue in court later on yeah those footages might be helpful in terms of whether it's a cop that's in trouble or it's a criminal that's in trouble and we're trying to yeah. figure out do they put this person in jail or for how long yeah. even yeah. all the sort of the implementation of, of the justice part now after somebody gets arrested yeah. might, be, might improve as a result of this and that's that's measurable to some degree but it's probably you're going to see in the long in the long term right that I'll yeah and it probably is uh you know a big piece of this is going to be how it interacts with other policies like given current policies and current practices it appears that body-worn cameras don't do anything <laughs> or don't have any benefits that we're hoping. But, um, you know, even within a very short time, like there's a lot of ongoing policy conversation about changing those policies and practices. And so maybe if we do, you know, a similar RCT next year of body-worn cameras under a different set of policies and a different set of accountability practices, you could see very different effects on behavior. And that would be really cool to, to study. Yeah, I, I think you point out in one interview that I heard with you uh, that a lot of the sort of uh, uh, sort of things that go viral in terms of police bad behavior or something like that is also from, coming from cell phones, right? So, so right. You know, we have we <laughs> have a solution. The, the point is like everybody has a camera everywhere all the time, right? Yeah. So that in some ways that that might be that might con might be actually contributing to the fact that um, the effect might be null because right. well you know. People know that there's cameras everywhere. In DC, you yeah. walk around, you're being filmed 100% of the time, so. <laughs> absolutely, whether it's a cell phone camera or just like security cameras around the city, absolutely. Like I think uh, most of us are probably just, you don't even notice the cameras anymore. We just sort of know that we're probably, if we're out in public, there's no presumption of privacy <laughs> at this point. So, so just wrapping up on, on this notion of the, the sort of like police reforms and ideas, anything else that you can remember or you can point to that, that seems encouraging at this point that, that um, we know something about? Yeah, so there's some really good evidence um, from changes in practice in like hiring practices back in the 80s, early 90s to increase the diversity of police forces. Um, and so uh, those basically there are a bunch of court mandates that, in, that required affirmative action that you know or, or required in some way that police departments increase the number of black officers and uh, female officers and both of those moves not only led to more hiring of black officers and female officers so like the court orders worked and the departments were able to find qualified people um, but it actually improved the policing so um, so crime rates fell in those communities and people were more likely to report crimes against them to so women were more likely to report domestic wow. violence and, and so on and and uh, black residents were more likely to report if they'd been victimized to a crime when they were more officers on the force that looked like them um, and i think you know this kind of makes sense if you think that a big piece of this is just trust between police officers in their communities and if people you know have a sense that you are going to care about them and the types of problems that they have then they're going to be more likely to not only tell you about bad things that have happened to them, but probably cooperate with you to help solve those crimes and keep them from happening in the future. And so, you know, that evidence from the past does not automatically mean that if we encourage more diversity now, we're going to see, you know, similar effects. Maybe, you know, already we've got police departments that are much more diverse than they were in the past. Um, but I think it's worth trying. And there's some really, there's a, a 
a researcher named Elizabeth Linos at UC Berkeley who does some really neat uh, uh, field experiments with police departments to around hiring and basically just trying different messages to get new and different people to apply to police forces. And so if we think part of the problem here is that we want different people than currently are signing up to be an officer um, or even just more people to choose from so that we can be choosier and we can fire some people without worrying about how we're going to fill their spot. Um, we're going to need to, to run those kinds of experiments. And so she's, she's finding that actually there's some really good strategies that really, that aren't hard. It's just a matter of changing the way we talk about the role of a police officer. And so that's, that's, that's encouraging. And, and, and I, something that you don't hear very often, I think, and as, as you're talking about before, right, the discourse between what we can learn and know from the data versus what politicians are reacting to and how things are portrayed in the media are, 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 are sometimes very different. Yeah. All right, let's, let's, let's get to, to, to your work and, and the, the Justice Tech Lab that you run at, at A&M. Tell us a little bit about, I guess, your research agenda generally, but also in particular, uh, what the, the Justice Tech Lab is. Sure. So, uh, so broadly, I study crime and discrimination, but within that, I'm very interested in the impacts of technology on public safety, as well as prisoner reentry. What ha what happens to people when they come out of prison, and how to help them reintegrate into society. Uh, and those might sound on their face like very different topics. There is a decent amount of overlap, um, but I've kind of come at them for for different reasons. Um, and the Justice Tech Lab, uh, you know, really started based on my, in my initial interest on the role of technology in public safety, but but has expanded um, uh, to, to include research on a variety of criminal justice topics, um, particularly on, you know, interested in um, uh, increasing fairness and effectiveness of, of our policies in the criminal justice system. And so I've got a great team of research assistants and students that work with me um, and uh, doing a variety of projects that are, you know, often often we're going out and trying to get data <laughs> that people might not have made public in the past and um and trying to use those data to understand what works in communities across the country and so that's that's what are I'm those are those students and ras mostly uh, economists or 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 a variety of different backgrounds mostly economists yeah so um you know i try very hard to to find whether it's undergrads or these pre-docs, uh, so recent college grads that are interested in getting a PhD, I'm trying to find people that are interested in, in a career in academic research. Um, and they may or may not want to be economists. They might want to go into public policy or be considering a variety of options. But um, for the type of work I do, having some sort of economics background is usually helpful. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on, but uh, um, continue here on the, on the, on the, the sort of technology aspect of it, the types of things that interest you in terms of technology effect on 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 the criminal justice system. What are the things that you that are I don't know more interesting these days that are having more of an impact? Uh, you know, that makes us maybe hopeful that that there's there's uh, lots of improvements to come. Ooh, um, you know, I feel like so much of my job right at this point is about like. Uh, bring the bad news to policy conversations. Like actually this technology isn't going to work as well as you think it is. But, uh, but I, questions like this remind me that like, you know, one of the reason I got into this, the reason that I, you know, am studying technology in the first place is it's just so cool and exciting to think about the potential. I guess your uh, DNA work, your DNA work is very positive, the results. Yeah, yes, yes. So, 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 one, so one place where I actually do find very big benefits, um, bigger than I think I certainly expected going into this, this line of work is in DNA databases. Um, and so uh, just a little bit of background on this policy, basically every US state um, and many countries around the world have databases of criminal offenders DNA as well as crime, uh, DNA samples from crime scenes. Um, and so basically the, the idea is that if you are charged or, or convicted of a particular crime, and this is, it depends on state law, which crimes are included here, um, you're required to provide a DNA sample. And then the government uses, analyzes that DNA sample just to provide a, an identifying string of numbers. It's just, it's just to identify you. They're not doing any sort of like, um, you know, checks into your health or anything like that. But then they upload, upload that identifying string of numbers to the database and it's compared with strings of numbers from the crime scene data. Right. And so the idea here is that if there's some sort of cold case out there uh, where they haven't been able to identify you as a suspect and you committed that crime, the DNA will match you to that. And you'll be more likely to be caught in these cases where you would otherwise would not have been a suspect um, for police. And so uh, this would increase the likelihood of getting caught for your crimes. As an economist, I think of that as 
as kind of a very standard Gary Becker style model where uh, that should have a big deterrent effect on criminal behavior. If I know that I'm more likely to get caught, this increases then the expected cost of committing crime and I should therefore commit less crime because it's more costly. Um, that's when you say Gary Becker type is like, you know, assuming rationality on the, on the yes. individual involved mm -hmm. in it, which was something that was very controversial when it first started. The idea that an economist could study crime, right? It's like, well, no, a criminal is not going to be thinking rationally. Well, it turns out that they do. Incentives matter almost it everywhere. It turns right? out incentives matter even for criminals, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, not necessarily every criminal, right? There are lots of people out there who commit crimes because they're drunk or high right. or something else, and they're not being super rational in the moment. But even the decision to go get drunk or high with your friends, if you are know you're, you know, there's some likelihood you're going to get into trouble, that is a rational decision, the, the decision to kind of put yourself in that situation. And so, um, yeah, so it turns out people respond to incentives and they respond to this incentive in particular. So I have uh, research from the US where the data is much worse, <laughs> but I kind of did the best I could with it and found that um, uh, for those who are, who are yeah, you know, charged or released just, just on either side of the expansion date for, for a DNA database, so a database uh, a state decides to add convicted robbers, to say, to their database. If you're convicted of robbery just before that date, uh, the, where the law goes into effect, you don't go in the database. If you're convicted just after the law goes into effect, you do go in the database. Now, you have very similar people who just by the, the lack of there, right? timing, it's, it's essentially random whether you go in the database or not. It's a beautiful natural experiment that economists love. And so then I can compare those people over time and see what happens. And it turns out that the person who goes in the database is much less likely to reoffend or uh, going forward. Um, and so that was, you know, saw that in the US data, but again, the data is super messy and there were a whole bunch of caveats to that. Uh, and then I wound up um, linking up with some economists in, uh, in Denmark where they have much better data, but very similar policies and studied um, a big database expansion there. And we find with their much better data, we can have a much, much cleaner measurement of this we find that people who go into the database are 40% less likely to be convicted of another crime than the people who, you know, were, were charged just before uh, and, and don't go in the database. So it does seem to have, you know, people, people do seem to know that this... Um, and and, that I, assume, I, and I assume that, that that number is controlling for some sort of level of service they receive by being arrested the first time. I think that there's a... a sort of like uh, results coming out of Scandinavia, for example. You go to prison in Scandinavia, you come out as a much better citizen as, for example, as <laughs> in the US, right? Somehow they figure out that system and I don't know if they figure out, there's other issues, but but that's all controlling for that, right? So the, this decrease is... is these, are, these are people who have been charged at least once before. So they, you know, there has to be an initial charge that puts you in our sample. And then... And then those people, like based on your first charge, you're either you're convicted or whatever, and the de going in the database doesn't affect that. So all these right. people are going to be similar on all those types of dimensions. Um, but but the people charged just after the expansion date, their identity is added to the database so that going forward, they'll be more likely to match to crime scene evidence. And they're the ones that we see if they drop in recidivism for. And that's 42%, which is like Huge. a very large drop, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, yeah. I mean, this is just one of those papers where like, we, uh, I'm not sure we believed it at first. And it was like, let's just go at this every which way and, and make sure that our results are robust to like anything we can throw at it. And the, the check that we do that I, I find the most convincing is we kind of run this, do the exact same thing we, we do in every other, other year. Like let's pretend that this policy change had happened, you know, it actually happened in 2005. Let's pretend it happened in 2004, or 2006 or 2007 or 2003 and run our exact analysis. And maybe there's just something weird about the structure well, of our right, analysis right. that's picking up a, a fake effect, right? And it turns out we just get like really precise zeros in all those other years. <laughs> and then we get this huge effect in 2005. And it's like, okay, there's something sure, like sure. that actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I just thought about a question on that. What was it? Uh, so yeah, so so you say 42% is the rel is a sort of relative risk, right? But but uh, what's the baseline of recidivism in, 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 in Denmark anyway? To start oh with. my goodness, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's not that different from in the US. Um, people do still recidivate at pretty high rates. Pretty high rates, right? Um, okay. So, yeah. so that they're 4 to 42 is actually very important. Because, you know, if it, we're talking about something that's very low to begin with, who cares, right? But no, it's, it's right. actually pretty high. So, so the 42 becomes very, very relevant. 
Right, and we can actually see, I mean, it's a much less clean experiment, so we don't, uh, we don't write home about this result, but we can actually like, plot out reported crime rates in Denmark through this threshold. And if, you know, if this effect is real, we should see a drop in crime. And we do see a drop in reported crime starting in 2005. So, um, you know, there might be other stuff going on that's contributing to that, but it does, it's consistent with this idea that like, this is a real change in behavior that's improving public safety. Um, and it's in line with my, my US data had, had also shown like there's a reduction in crime rates when this stuff happens. So, uh, it's really so big benefit, big benefit of these policies of expanding databases of DNA material. Uh, what are the costs? I mean, how, how about the costs on this? How, how expensive they are? Are there any costs that you worry about in having those, those databases available? Yep. So, uh, so there are certainly financial costs. Um, the financial costs of setting up a database and setting up all the crime labs that you need uh, are, you know, it's somewhat expensive. Uh, so it's not, it's not cheap. But at this point, everyone's got those labs. <laughs> and so the question is like, you know, and, and the questions I'm looking at in this papers is what happens when you add a marginal offender? You add one more offender, you add one more group of offenders. And so there the costs are really cheap. So it's like, you know. You already have the infrastructure in place, right? You've already got the infrastructure. So it's really just the cost is a saliva swab and like putting it in a machine. Um, at this point, it's all standardized. And so, um, so the financial costs are really pretty negligible relative to the big benefits that we're, we're seeing in terms of reductions in crime. The costs that people talk about um, and that I think are, are um, more, uh, more relevant to policy conversations is the perceived privacy costs of these things. So the government is taking your DNA and <laughs> analyzing it in some way and probably storing it um, uh, in most cases because you know often the standard the FBI updates its standards every once in a while to make sure you know we're at the cutting edge technology and we'll have to like reanalyze all the DNA again. Right. Um, and so so you know depending on your your level of trust of the government, you might not want them to have a sample of your DNA on file. Uh, and even though under current law, they can't do anything with that DNA other than just come up with that identifying string of numbers, some people do worry about sort of a slippery slope where, well, now they have it, imagine, you know, it's not that hard to imagine that in 10 years something happens where they start analyzing all the DNA for, uh, to see who's predisposed to schizophrenia or substance abuse or other things that could predispose you to, to criminal behavior. Um, you know, my general view is like, you know, we're, we're not there, we're not there, <laughs> and then, you know, we can kind of look at the current law and we do have a choice about whether to, to cross that line or not. But, but at the same time, I think, you know, there are lots of other technologies out there that are quite invasive, uh, you know, putting cameras everywhere, for instance, or having people wear GPS monitors or blood alcohol content monitors or, um, yeah, just a variety of stuff like that. Uh, and so relative to, you know, having, a cam having cameras everywhere, having someone's DNA and just getting this identifying string of numbers off of it, to me seems relatively in, not invasive, but people have very different perceptions of this. And, um, and so reasonable people can disagree. And unfortunately it's something we haven't figured out how to quantify yet, kind of what those perceived privacy costs are. Yeah, I think one, one of the costs is the misuse of the, of the information as well, right? I think that the, the, the sort of prosecutor's fallacy of a match you know, you need to understand what's the probability of that person committing a crime given the match versus the other way around, which is something that, that people, there's a lot of problems with that. When you have a match, that, that, you know, depending on how the match come about, uh, if you find a match in, and it turns out to be something on the other side of the country, there might be the probability of it being actual match is much smaller than something that, oh, no, no, you were living in that house and like the which is <laughs> example, right? Yeah. And that's <laughs> much be, higher probability. Of that's an issue with DNA evidence more broadly, right? So that's kind right, of beyond, exactly, the, exactly. beyond the DNA database and thinking about like how do we understand the probability. Oh, but the ability to scan DNA databases all over the place for, for like, I think that there's the family issue situation that I think we have uh, seen some issues in on, in England, I think about, about uh, searching across. Right, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so that, that, that's what I, I think is something that could lead to more false positives uh, on. Essentially, yeah, so they're essentially looking, in those cases, you're essentially looking for a partial DNA match. And so you're just gonna, yeah, you're gonna cast a much wider net and most of those people are not going to be the person who actually committed the crime. Um, yeah, so they're two kind of, I, I, you know, I think people who are thoughtful about this, it's like, you know, in any given case, the DNA evidence should never be right. the only exactly. thing that gets you, right? You also have to show that the person, you know, doesn't have an alibi or was there, you know, all the stuff. And then also like DNA, just in general, like DNA can prove that you were in a place, um, but it can't prove you committed a crime there. 
and so there is still other stuff going on. But yeah, um, and, that, and that's the, the do, general problem of 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 uh, uh, you know sort of creating a, a sense of or oh, the expert, the scientist says yeah. you know, that this thing is infallible, and it's yeah. not. It's something that we have to put into context, and and uh, so that, that's a cost that's more like education, or how to use this information appropriately, not necessarily a cost yeah. of listening to the information, is how to process that information. Yeah, and that that is a super interesting aspect of all of this with. Um, with forensics, I think more broadly, yeah. especially with, there are a lot of forensics, like DNA, I think is like pretty solid, <laughs> but like there are a lot of forensic sciences that are not real sciences. Like and fingerprint, so, uh, fingerprint or, or, or ballistics are pretty bad, right? Fingerprinting, generally. it turns out, yeah, it's just like, it's entirely visual. Like people think of it as being, you know, you could imagine a world where we do these fancy machine learning algorithms with maybe over the last year someone's done that but like as far as i know that is still not the way things the way, yeah. <laughs> and and you know the most recent thing i heard on fingerprinting is eventually like we just we don't need to be that worried because within not that long dna and like the analysis of touch dna is going to be so much better that when we take fingerprints we're actually not going to look at the fingerprint we're going to be taking dna, from, DNA it. from it right <laughs> <laughs> so like forget the problems of fingerprinting because it's just going to be obsolete in a couple of years but uh, yeah, like fire science, like all this stuff is just like kind of nonsense. Um, and so, uh, yeah, thinking about how, you know, so there's the science piece of this and the conversation about what should happen and, and what, you know, what is effective, like um, in terms of just like for scientists in the lab, and that's new, not the kind of scientist I am. Uh, but, but then there's also the piece of how it's portrayed and understood in a courtroom, both by a jury and a judge, and um, and they are, you know, even just like basic probabilities aren't necessarily understood well by the general population. So that's right. uh, it all becomes much more complicated in that context. I guess it's a good segue for us to get to your paper that you're presenting today at, at UT um, on the role of of sort of machine learning AI techniques in predicting recidivism uh, and how that gets used in the criminal justice system right now. So so tell us about that. Yeah, so I'm talking about risk assessments and criminal sentencing context in particular. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of interest in whether uh, um, machine learning in particular, but just sort of like computers <laughs> and, and regression technology and all like of that. Just regression can probably, be a machine learning thing, right? <laughs> just even a, basic, even a basic regression could, uh, could help us make better predictions about who's going to go on to reoffend. Um, and that could help us perhaps use incarceration in a more effective way. Um, you make sure we're only locking up the people who are highest risk. And also potentially, you know, if we do this in a standardized way across all defendants, uh, use incarceration in a more and, and sentence in general more fairly across different people. So we don't have, you know, a judge treating the black defendant differently than the white defendant because they're using the same risk score, you know, that's calculated the same way for both of them. So rewind, of rewind, rewind a bit, rewind a bit. So, so, so yeah. the typical the past, people might not necessarily know how mm -hmm. these things work, right? So you go to court, sure. you're charged with a crime, you get convicted now, and now a judge has to make an assessment, a decision on whether to, whether to put you in jail or not, or how, for how long and so on, whether to release you on, on, on early. There's lots of decisions a judge has to make, right? Yeah. And at that point, uh, the sort of before these techniques were available, the judge would just look at evidence, maybe from the case, maybe some some depositions from family members, circumstantial evidence about that person to make a consideration. And we've been trying yeah, so to they, sort of automate some of that, right? Right. So they have a lot of information. And so there's sort of a question here about like, does this actually provide more information? Like often the judges have a big stack of papers. There's some sort of pre-sentencing report that could involve um, you know, interviews with the person, maybe psychological analyses, maybe testimony from, yeah, the witnesses or, or family members or so on. Um, and so, and they know their criminal history, obviously. And so they are deciding, you know, what sentence is reasonable for this person standing in front of them. Uh, but um, there have been some, some policy simulations that show that if we just had like, um, if we had a computer use that data to run a, re to run a regression and predict the person's risk and just, you know, allocate sentence, allocate incarceration only to like the most risky people based on the data. If we did that, instead of having the judge lock them up and you know, whatever order they think is appropriate, we would actually, uh, it, it appears from those simulations like the judges routinely make mistakes in who they lock up. So they're routinely locking up people that are much lower risk and would not have gone on to commit crimes. Um, 
And so some of these, these studies have just like really eye popping results that you could, you know, you could reduce crime rates by 25% holding incarceration constant, or you could reduce incarceration rates by 40% with no change in crime rates. If you just let the computer decide instead. And so that's sort of like the motivation for all this, that maybe like people are just really bad at making predictions and we're easily distracted by information that is relevant. Uh, you know, so I'm hungry or my football team lost this weekend or something like that. And that puts me in a bad mood. And so I take it out on the person in front of me. Um, and so we know that's true. There are studies showing this is true. This is like not a surprise to people who study psychology. And so maybe the computer can do better. And so that's the motivation. Um, so in this paper um, with Megan Stevenson, we used data from Virginia, uh, where they implemented risk assessments and criminal sentencing for nonviolent offenders back in the in the early 2000s, um, and and study like what actually happened in the real world where we implemented these things. This isn't just looking at a policy simulation. We're not looking at just how accurate the prediction is or whatever. We're saying let's see what happened when they're used in the real world, the way they're actually used. Like the judge now has one more piece of paper in front of them that has the risk score and has a recommendation for diversion or not based on that risk score. And what do they do with it? And it turns out that they pay attention to it, but it doesn't lead to any of the benefits that we had hoped for. Hmm. And, actually, and the punchline really seems to be that most of the, um, the advantage of the risk assessment is it, it, uh, identifies all of the young people as being very high risk right. because it turns out age is like the, one of the best predictors of whether you're going to go on to commit another crime. Um, young men in particular are very high risk. And so the, the computer says, hey, here are all the young men, go lock them up. And the judges, for good reason, don't want to lock up young people. There's a long tradition in the legal system for leniency and um, uh, toward, toward uh, for young people because there's a general sense they're less culpable for their crimes. The brains aren't really developed and so on. And so they don't lock up those young people. They basically just ignore the risk assessment most of the time. Um, and so we don't see the big gains that people per, like thought we would get, um, but it's for this very good reason. And, and it suggests to us that the judges aren't actually making mistakes. They have a different objective in mind. Um, and you know, as economists would say, they have a different objective function. Uh, and they're optimizing a different objective function. And so it really points to this bigger picture for criminal justice reform. It really points to this idea that if we want to change the behavior of the actors on the ground in our criminal justice system, we're going to need to understand what mo currently motivates them and what their current objective function is. And until we understand that, we're not gonna know how to change their behavior. And so this is a perfect example of the legislature was like, we're gonna get, you know, the, the specific goal of this policy was to divert the 25% lowest risk nonviolent offenders for incarceration. And there was no change in incarceration yeah. rate at all. Because <laughs> the judges just said like, no thanks. I don't want to lock those people up. So, um, or they, you know, they just didn't, didn't right. do what, what the risk assessment said. So um, yeah, so it's a bit of a bit of bad news added to the conversation, uh, which is which I, what I'm much more comfortable. So, so there's there's some some <laughs> press and I haven't followed this very, very closely, but uh, yeah, sure. I know that there's a lot of um, people study now the sort of uh, potential problems with these algorithms themselves of, of how mm -hmm. how you know very biased they are and and my understanding for the most part is that is that the bias associated with them is not with the mechanisms or the algorithms in place is more like with the data that we gather to train those algorithms yeah. and, and so on so did you do you have anything to say about that what's your understanding generally about that part of the the, the picture here Yep. So there, are, yeah, as you said, lots of computer scientists who are thinking deeply about these issues and like if there are ways how one can deal with kind of biased data, um, and uh, and kind of the, the a basic example of this that we would worry about here is that if we know that black men are more likely to be convicted uh, or arrested and convicted for committing a crime, and then a white man who does the exact same thing is, and we know that again there's racial bias in the system, mm -hmm. um, then an algorithm that is trying to predict future risk is going to accurately say the black man is higher risk because he's more likely to be convicted of a crime going forward, right? But that's not because he's more likely to actually reoffend. It's because he's more likely to be convicted, conditional on the same behavior. So, so we worry about, you know, both for future behavior and you know, the same thing happens in the past, the black man also has a longer criminal record for exactly the same reason, right? Um, and so, so we worry about those kinds, that's what people, mean when they say that there's 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 bias kind of baked into the data um the way megan and i approach this is again as economists as social scientists who said like well you know 
people are biased too, the judges are biased too, and they have all the same information that the computer is using. So the question here isn't, is the algorithm biased or is the data biased? The question is, is it more or less biased than the judge is? And what actually happens when we give the judges information? And so it turns out when we actually give the judges information, when they implemented risk assessments and sentencing in Virginia, um, there was no impact on racial disparities in Virginia. Now, I went into the study really actually expecting it to, to reduce racial disparities. I was one of those people who was like really bullish on the potential here of, to reduce bias by judges. Um, and it turns out I'm disappointed. <laughs> there was no benefit. But for those who are really worried that these risk assessments are going to do real harm and widen racial disparities, it turns out they're too pessimistic. And the judges, they're basically just do just as, just as badly as the judges do. On that measure. Yeah, and, and it, it speaks about about the sort of a uh, uh, general notion of trade offs on the on the so the information is there and people are trying to make the the best assessment of information whatever it is the, the way right and and whether to to not focus on a particular new tool in this case the result was no but, but like the possibility of the new tool potentially reducing uh, problems even though it's not perfect is something that's not thinking through the trade off very carefully right you, you think well you know. If it's not perfect, I'm not going to do it. It's like, well, that's not the game. The game is, is marginal improvement. And, and thinking on the margin is something that you and I are you know, trained to do, but, but totally. it's not what I think a lot of folks in charge of the decisions are, right? So I can think about the same situation happening in, in uh, banking applications. I mean, there's this sort of, uh, I think there was a, what was it? There's a company that tried to um, uh, sort of optimize uh, whether to give student loans or not based on, on data, and they got some grades from people and so on. And then folks are like, oh my God, that's terrible because it's leading to biased outcomes uh, in terms of race. It's like, well, is it any more biased than filling out right. the FAFSA score and going to the bank and whatever? Like they have yeah. the same information, just they're crunching differently. And the access right. to that information, if the system is already has contained some bias, it might be actually reducing, it might be an improvement. So don't stop right. them from, from doing it. And um, we do have examples, like I have previous research on ban the box policy. I was going to say, I was going to go there. <laughs> kind of motivation here, which is part of the reason I was really, you know, optimistic about the potential of, of these, these tools in this context. So the question, you know, uh, there's sort of this general human impulse, I think we have, that like when we know that particular information is biased, uh, then like we know that like, you know, your past criminal record probably includes some racial bias because it includes how police officers treated you in the past. Then a lot of people are going to say, well, we'll just don't let them look at the previous criminal history anymore. Or in the case of Ban the Box, don't, don't let them, don't see, let them see the criminal record until the end of the hiring process. Um, and that is sort of like our first impulse of a policy. But as economists, we hear about that and we think, well, but what are they going to do when they can't See that information anymore they're probably you know you haven't changed their incentives they still don't want to hire people with criminal records if that's that was their initial you know um, goal. Uh, right. goal and so now they're just going to try to guess and if people if black men are more likely to have criminal records than any black man they see now they're going to guess he's probably got a criminal record uh, so it actually improves employment outcomes to provide that information because the black men who don't have the many many black men who don't have criminal records can signal their clean record and they get a job. But when you take that information away, none of them get jobs. And that's basically what we find um, in, the, in the band the box research and was totally possible in the risk assessment context too. Like maybe even if these algorithms are biased against black defendants, if in the absence of this risk score, the judges assumed even worse about black defendants, then providing this information could actually uh, lead to some of those black defendants um, having better outcomes. Um, it's not what we wound up seeing in practice, but it was possible. Yeah, and, and, and that's sort of like mindset of unintended consequences is again something that, that mm -hmm. the people they are putting forward the proposals of Ben the Box, for example, and I think a lot of those were, they came out in, in even through ballot initiatives in some places, right? Um, um, it's it, it just like I think that a lot of those votes were coming from a good place, but absolutely. But but without thinking through the fact that you know there's there's a you're creating a problem of information and I might create actually more severe problems as a result. There's a good motivation for an employer to say, maybe good or bad, but the point is that, that I understand somebody depending on some job saying, I don't wanna hire somebody with a criminal record and um, they're not gonna stop thinking about that uh, right. by, by, the, by the bend the box situation. Right, and much like I said, you know, the, the, you know, my takeaway from this paper about criminal justice reform is we need to really understand 
what the objective functions are of these, these actors, of the judges, of the prosecutors who are actually using this information and doing something we don't want them to do. If we wanna change their behavior, we need to fully understand what's motivating them. The same is true of the employers in the ban the box situation. If the goal is to have employers hire more people with criminal records, we need to understand why they currently don't want to hire people with criminal records. And that's something we don't fully understand yet. And that is a major challenge to policy in this, in this space. Is it they're worried about legal liability? Are they worried about safety? Are they worried about productivity, reliability? Like, what is it? Because whatever it is, we can then go address that concern. But until we figure that out, we're kind of stuck. Right. All right, so let's wrap up with the basically touching on, on this notion that you work on an area of study that is traditionally populated by sociologists and criminologists and some folks in public health. Uh, and we touch upon this notion that, that economists come at these questions in slightly different ways. They, they, they have a training to think very hard about incentives, think very hard about un unintended consequences, basically the notion of general equilibrium, touch some over here, move something over there. And finally, focus on uh, on like always very clearly focus on cost benefit analysis. Um, so, in your experience, and I can share a little bit about my experience and work with some folks here, but I want to hear from you on your experience on dealing with those folks. Is that is that a resistance generally about having that kind of mindset uh, when working with economists? Is there? A, a, I feel that we at least anecdotally, by looking at how things are described in the media or in 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 public discourse in terms of policy making it's never sounding like the economist wants to make it sound. It sounds like sociologists are having more of an influence there uh, and, and th then the public health people have more of an influence there than how an economist would portray th those issues. So I guess, I don't know, that I don't have a specific question, more like your, your sort of experience on this and how you think the role of economists, how can we improve the role of economists actually in helping with those issues? Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm biased and I think the <laughs> bullpit economists- I am too, so that's okay. Super important. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I spend a lot of time talking with practitioners and policymakers and funders uh, about why they should be talking to economists when they're interested in these topics. And, and even to students who are interested in criminal justice policy and have never thought that they should study economics, right? Like I, and I think part of it is this general perception that economics is all about money. And so when people hear that I'm, you know, when I used to travel and occasionally be in a taxi or something and the driver's like, so what do you do? And like, I'm an economist. And they're, oh, what do you, you're banking, the stock market. And it's like, oh, I study crime. And they're like, oh, white collar crime. You must study, you know, <laughs> bank fraud or something. And like, no, no. And so, yeah, I mean, I think a big part of this is people don't know that economics is about, you know, how people respond to incentives. Um, and, and that's really, uh, and thinking through these trade-offs, which are so fundamental to any policy decision, um, including in criminal justice policy. So I actually started my own podcast a little over a year ago where, for, for exactly this reason, like I, I kind of got tired of having these conversations and just like trying to, you know, explain to people over and over again why they should be listening to economists if they care about criminal justice policy. And I figured I'd just start showing them. And so now on this, on my podcast, Probable Causation, I interview every, every episode and uh, someone who studies, who, you know, uh, who studies crime and criminal justice policy and we could talk through a specific paper and, talk, and basically I'm trying to show people how economists think about these very interesting policy questions. Um, and, and the goal is really to hopefully pull some more students into studying economics, but also to showcase the really cool work that economists are doing in this space. Um, so yeah, totally hear you. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think this is an area where a variety of disciplinary perspectives is super useful. Right. Um, criminologists tend to have a lot more institutional knowledge than economists do. They spend a lot more time actually in prison and jails and talking to people so that's super valuable but I think our empirical toolkit is top-notch and if you want to know what the policy what the effect of the policy is going to be you need to be talking to economists about that I mean I, I don't have to I mean, my shirt tells you everything I think about that. <laughs> that, that, that's what we do we spend time here trying to educate our students create opportunities like this to talk to people that, that work hard to understand trade-offs of policy making uh, I think my efforts have been a lot of it dedicated to, to teaching classes to folks who are not necessarily in economics majors and just the power of economics and statistics and giving them tools to think about policies, not about how it sounds, not about how the, the intended consequences in terms of like, you know, oh, we're going to make the world a better place. Like we all want to do that. We disagree right. sometimes on how to do that. And a lot of the disagreement comes from the evidence. And that's what we're trying to do. So 
Absolutely. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me and I'm really looking forward to the talk this afternoon. Great, thank you so much. This was great.